Today we're continuing our series, Simple Christmas. Simple Christmas. Why simple? Because more and more lately I feel like Christmas is anything but simple, right? It's getting complicated, chaotic, and stressful. But Christmas doesn't have to be so busy, so cluttered, so stressful, and so expensive. There's a peaceful simplicity, simplicity behind Christmas that often gets trampled over in our frenzy to buy gifts, plan parties, and decorate the house. So I want to talk about simple Christmas building off of last week. This week, I want to talk about, tell them a message this, slow down. Slow down. I want us to slow down. Why? Because... Christmas is often talked about as not just being the most wonderful time of the year, but also the busiest time of the year. And if we want to have a simple Christmas, we need to learn to slow down. Now, when I think of slowing down, I think of time, right? Having more time, not enough time, how time goes by. And I've been reading, and I've been reading how time has evolved. Our relationship with time has changed over the years. In fact, from the very beginning, once man started keeping track of time, uh, people started to complain. In fact, around 200 B.C., people started to complain about the very first ever clock, a sundial. There's a Roman playwright named Platus, and in his plays, he actually writes lines about people complaining about the sundial. This is what they say. It cut and hacked my day so wretchedly into small portions. Right? They were complaining about the sundial. Little did they know, thousands of years later, what we would have, right? But it wasn't until the year 1370, until man's relationship with time truly changed forever. Historians say this is a turning point in time. And what happened then was the first public clock tower was built in Cologne, Germany. And everything changed. No more listening to our bodies to wake up when they were rested. Instead, it's a nine-to-five work schedule every day, waking up not when we feel ready, but when our alarm sounds that oppressive siren, right? And we wake up. Then in 1879, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Now people could stay up as late as they wanted. Why? Because they could see at night. This this stat is going to totally shock you, okay? But before Edison the average amount of sleep people would get at night is 11 hours. Lord Jesus. <laughs> right? 11 hours. You know where we're at in America? About seven hours a night, the average is. Seven hours. 11 to seven because our relationship with time has changed. No wonder coffee is a multi-billion dollar industry. Am I right? I mean, come on. Energy drink, yeah, because we're not sleeping at night. It wasn't that long ago, and our parents would remember, and when stores closed at 6 p.m.? Do you remember that? Do you remember when 7-Eleven said they would open 24-7? It was revolutionary. Who's going to go to the store at 2 o'clock in the morning? That is absurd, right? Now things are open nonstop. There was a time when on Sundays, nothing was open. You went to church, right? There was a time where Sunday was a day of rest and to worship. Now it's filled with our kids' soccer games, wrestling matches, dance recitals, football games, a chance to get ahead in the office, to buy more stuff we don't even need, and so on. I remember when the mail, remember the mail was only delivered Monday through Friday? Now we have unmarked Amazon delivery trucks flying through our neighborhoods, leaving me packages on Sunday afternoon when I get home from church. I mean, it is crazy how our relationship with time has changed. On top of that, we don't even have time to talk about the year all of this radically changed forever. The year that many people believe in history will go down as one of the greatest changes of our history to our our relationship with time, greater than the light bulb, the printing press, than anything. It was the year that Steve Jobs released the iPhone. The iPhone was released. It was about that time that uh, Facebook was open up to everyone with an email address. It was about that time that Twitter got its own platform. It was about that time that all these other technological breakthroughs happened. It was all in about the year 2007, and they call that the start of the digital age. And life has forever been changed. Constant access in a thousand different ways. You have to check 10 different things to make sure no one's contacting you, right? Phone calls, who even uses their phone to make a phone call, right? I mean, you got to check your DMs, your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram. You got to check, right, your text messages, your FaceTimes, your WhatsApp. I mean, it's insane. It's literally crazy. What's my point? My point is that life is busier than ever, and it's not good for you. Life 
is busy. And a life of hurrying, rushing, and never stopping going is not good for you. It's not good for you physically. It's not good for you mentally. It's not good for you relationally. And I want to be honest with you, it is not good for you spiritually. And I want you to know ahead of time, I am preaching to myself that I am dealing with. It's the absolute truth. In fact, I kind of have this like thesis that I want to prove throughout my message. Something for you to just think about during this message. And it's this. Busyness might be the greatest enemy to our faith. Busyness might just be the greatest enemy we have to our faith. You know why? Because Satan is a lot smarter than we give him credit for. He doesn't just show up as a red demon with tails, horns, and a pitchfork. All right? In fact, here are some ways he might show up in your life. As a notification on your phone while you're just trying to read your Bible. He might show up as a Netflix binge. He might show up as a straight-up dopamine addiction to Instagram and social media. He might show up as another night in the office missing dinner with your family. He might show up at a kid's sporting event where, once again, you guys are in church and you're, you keep missing it. He might show up after commitment, after commitment, after commitment, at a life of constantly living at light speed in constant and endless hurry. In fact, there's a great quote of this book I read uh, from John Mark Comer, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he says this in his quote. He says, Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Well, there's truth in that. Both sin and busyness have the exact same effect. They cut off your connection to God, to other people, and even to your own soul. I mean, do you know that busyness, rushing, hurrying, a life of this nonstop going could actually be considered anti-Christian? Right? It could, I mean, think about what Jesus said was the most important commandment. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. This is what Jesus said. He said, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor As yourself. All right, let's boil it down to one word. What is that? It's love, right? The greatest commandment is to love God, to love people. The greatest commandment is to love. All right, so right now you might be trying to connect the dots and be like, okay, if uh, busyness is anti Christian, if busyness is an enemy to our faith, and love is the most important thing, I don't understand. There's no connection. Well, let's explore what love is. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13 4 love is patient and kind. Love is patient and in kind. How could we truly love if we're always in a hurry? My worst moments as a father, as a husband, and as a pastor are when I'm hurried. It's when I'm rushing. Ask my wife. Ask my kids when I'm in a rush. How little I love. How angry I get. How I say hurtful remarks. How I rush people. How I don't have time to help And I get frustrated when someone needs my attention or they take longer than they're supposed to. When you're rushing, when you're running late, you become filled with anger, tension. You say nagging or hurtful comments. All the opposite of love. You cannot love if you're always rushed. Why? Because love is patient. Rushing is the opposite of patience. (laughs) Right? You can't. You can't love if you're always in a hurry. Why? Because I'm rarely ever kind when I'm rushing, when I'm busy. Busyness might be the greatest enemy to our faith. But here's the problem. Our world makes us think that slow is a bad thing. Fast is good. Slow is bad. Anybody like slow internet, right? I mean, slow is bad. I'll prove it to you. When someone is not smart, they have a low IQ, what do we call them? slow. When you get bad service at a restaurant, what do we say? It was lousy. They were too slow. When you don't like a movie, nothing happened. It was too, it was dragged on. It was too slow. What happened in the sporting event? Nothing. It was boring. Why? Because it was too slow. Slow to score. Slow to big plays. It was slow. In our society, slow is bad. The dictionary says, defines slow as mentally dull, stupid, sluggish. Society is very clear. Slow is bad. Fast is good. So go, 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 go. Do more, do more, and do it now, and do it fast. But in the kingdom of God, as a Jesus fowler, it's different. Well, it should be different. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says it like this. But the Holy Spirit produces 
this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of which are incompatible with hurrying, with rushing, with busyness. We already talked about love. Think of joy. Nearly all the people who study this, whether Christian or not, they'll all kind of say like the secret to tapping into joy is being present in the moment. Right? That's kind of you're present where you are. You're present where, with your moment. But how can you be present in the moment if you're always rushing, moving on to the next thing? It's hard to find joy when you're always in a hurry. How about patience? Can you truthfully tell me that you could be patient when you're in a rush? Truthfully. How about being patient with your kids while you're rushing out of the house and you're rushing and you're going, right? And they need help tying their shoe and they lost their sock and you got to go back in the house because they left their stuffed animal. And now they have to go pee after you've already asked them five times, but they want to wait till now, right? How patient are you? How patient are you when you're in a rush and you just got to run into the store really quick, right? You just got I'm just real quick, I'll be right out. And you get stuck behind someone who is walking unnecessarily slow. And then what are they, paying with coins? Coins? Use your credit card, we got to go, people. How patient, how kind are you when you're late to work and you got a big meeting and you get stuck in traffic? Oh, you honk the horn in kindness. You lovingly are honking that horn. You're, right? How kind are you? How patient are you? Do you have ooze, kindness and gentleness and self-control just oozing from you? No. My point is, busyness can often be the enemy with our walk with God. It's funny how they call it a walk with God. Not a sprint. Not a race. Right? Not a run. But a walk with God. I love this quote from Walter Adams. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, they say he kind of was a mentor to C.S. Lewis, and he says this, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. To walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Now, of course there are times where we hurry. Of course there are times where we're busy. Of course there's emergencies where we got to go, go, go. I remember when my wife was eight months pregnant with our baby and she got super sick, and man, we had to go. It was a rush. It was an emergency. I remember not that long ago when I was in a rush and it aggravated with all the snow and I stuck my fingers in my snowblower and, and well, it was an emergency. I had to go to the hospital. There's times when we rush. There's times when we're busy, but let's be honest with ourselves. We're living a life of busyness and rushing, so much so that we try to trick ourselves to saying it's normal. Instead of having an unrushed life, and on occasion, having moments of busyness, having seasons of busyness, we live the opposite way. We have a life of total busyness and chaos and rushing, and we hope to occasionally get a day of rest or a moment of peace. We're so used to everyone else telling us how busy they are and us being so busy, we convince ourselves it's normal, it's healthy, and it's the way things should be, all of which are not true. Here's one more quote i got to share with you from John Ortberg. He says this, For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. That's why I'm suggesting to you that busyness might be one of the greatest enemies of our faith. And I think it's time to slow down this Christmas. In fact, I want to read with you a story from the Bible about a woman who I think had the same struggle we have today. It's found in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. And it says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations she had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to do the work by myself? Tell me, tell her to help me. Now, I want to stop there in the story for a moment. 
I want to try to explain some things. I first want you to notice a few things. First, I want you to know something, that Martha is doing some important work here, right? Martha, everything she's doing is important. She's making the meal. She's preparing the house. She's making sure Jesus, she's doing some great work. I just want to say I'm thankful for all the Marthas. I'm thankful for every single person who works hard. I'm thankful for people who are more organized than me. I'm thankful for my wife who knows everything the kids need and there's meals prepared. I'm thankful for that. Okay, those are great things. So they're amazing people. But I also want you to notice that you might think this is not a traditional Christmas story. But I want to tell you how funny this story relates exactly to how Christmas is, right? Christmas season in America. What is Christmas? It's the time of year we celebrate when Jesus came to earth to be with us. And so how do we celebrate that time? We rush, we fret, we get stressed because the house needs to be decorated, cookies need to be made, and the meal has to be perfect. We have to buy gifts, plan parties to go to, families to visit, on top of our already overbooked schedules, and that's how we do it to celebrate Jesus. And what is Martha doing? The same thing. She's working super hard to celebrate the fact that Jesus is in her home. And there's one more thing I want you to notice before we finish the story, and it's crucial to the story. Martha said, my sister has left me to do all the work. Now, I was researching this verse, and some of the commentaries, they said in the Greek, you could, it could really mean that Mary was helping Martha. Mary and Martha were both preparing everything for Jesus, but when Jesus began to teach, Mary chose to put aside the work And to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now it's interesting they said she was sitting at the feet of Jesus because that was actually the posture a disciple would take to listen to their teacher. And so it leads me to believe that Martha and Mary were both working hard. But when the most important thing happened, Jesus began to teach. Mary chose to stop and sit at the feet of Jesus as a posture in the posture of a disciple. She spent time with Jesus. Let's finish the story. Verses 41 to 42 say this. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is funny, because this this might be the only time in Scripture someone came to Jesus for help, and he didn't help them, right? She came and said, Jesus, help me. He said, whoa, 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 Martha, I'm not going to take away what Mary has chosen. And so many times we don't slow down, especially when we're doing good things, right? And I know it needs to get done. I know if you don't do it, no one else will. I know you do it better than anyone else. But more often than not, we get caught up trying to fulfill social obligations and things that are just simply not that important. Our life can so easily get out of focus and out of control, and we try to live up to culture's standards of how we're supposed to act, and we become weary and burdened and tired, and we often miss out on what Jesus has for us. And honestly, this is a hard scripture to preach from because, truthfully, Martha was doing important stuff, and I don't want all the Marthas in the world to stop because the people who are unorganized, well, we're going to really struggle. But I don't want the Marthas in the world to work so hard that they never stop to enjoy their lives or hear what Jesus is speaking to them. I don't have all the answers, but I know this. The busier I get, the less I do the things that are healthiest for me. That's me. The busier I am, the less I do the things that are healthiest for me. The busier I get, the less I eat healthy. The busier I get, the less I work out. I sleep less. I read my Bible less. I pray less. Because busyness is probably the greatest enemy to our faith in our world today. Because the busier I get, the less of the healthy things I do for myself. In fact, I just want to share with you a personal story of mine, of me dealing with exactly what I'm talking about. I just want to share with you. And as I share the story, I don't want you to think, woe is me or pity on me. I don't want you to compare and say, I'm busier than, you might be busier than I was. But that's all the more reason to listen to what we're saying that many of you could probably relate to what I'm going to talk about in your own way. For me, I was at this period where uh, just a few weeks ago, I, I spoke uh, tons of times. I was working on the series, and, 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 I, and then I realized, anyways, I spoke about 12 Sundays in a row. Okay, so three months straight, I never missed a Sunday I spoke. 
And just so you kind of know a frame of reference, one message could take a half a week's hours easily if I want it to be good, and I stress out about that stuff. And so I spoke for 12 weeks in a row, 12 new messages. On top of that, in that 12-week period, I spoke two other places. So I spoke 14 times in 12 weeks. On top of that, uh, in that 12 weeks, there's one Sunday I spoke, and there's water baptisms after. On top of that, there was two Sundays I spoke, and two times after church, I did a whole baby dedication. On top of that, there was five Sundays that before I spoke, I was training people how to do our check-in stations. And then I'd speak one Sunday, I'd I trained how to people do check-in. I took offering. I spoke. I did the, all, everything. I did everything. I was like crazy. I was flying around. And I got to be honest with you. Man, I felt like I was preaching my best messages. I was like spitting fire. I was like, this is awesome. One time during this 12-week period, someone had the audacity to say, you're speaking 12 weeks in a row. You should take a break. And I was so offended. I was like, you know who I am? I can speak as long as I want to speak. I know what I'm doing. I kind of wanted to keep going. Finally, I took a break. And I got to tell you, I didn't know I was that tired. Not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually. I was worn out. I actually was not myself. In fact, I'm just going to be really real with you. My wife had to confront me. I wasn't eating healthy. I wasn't working out. I was angry all the time. I was yelling at the kids. I was mean to my wife. I wasn't reading my Bible. I was hardly praying. She had to confront me. She was 100% right. Something needed to be get done. And for the first time in my life, when I stopped preaching, I kind of didn't want to preach anymore. I felt like that fire in me just kind of left. I actually had the thought. I go, oh, this is why preachers stop preaching, because they don't want to. I remember after finishing that 14th message on that last Sunday, I got up and went to work the next day, and I sat in my office, and I kid you, I'm just being real. Why am I here? What am I going to do? I don't want to work on another message. I, what am I, why am I here? It took me at least two weeks of resting, of taking days off, of spending time with my families, just to know I wasn't ever always going to be like that. It took me two weeks just to, I actually remember the second week I was in church, and Jeremy, one of our singers and guitar players, was singing like this new song that I never liked. Okay, my wife showed me the song before we sang it, I never liked it. And we're singing this song, and I'm sitting in church, my usual grouchy whatever, and all of a sudden I go, this is a really nice song. I, it sounds so good. It, it seems clearer in here. Life is good. And all of a sudden, for the first time in who knows how long, I was able to sit in a posture like a disciple of Jesus and just spend time with Jesus. But we have to slow down. You have to rest. I know you're doing good work. I know there's another email to respond to. I know there's more hours. I know there's more money. I know there's more things. But we have to stop and sit at the feet of Jesus in a posture that I'm just here to listen. And whenever you decide to speak, that's okay because I'm not in a rush. And I'm waiting to hear from God. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is not what we all think. We all think, like, if I had more time, Everything would be right. But let's just be honest. If you had more time, what would you do? You would fill it with more things to do, and you'd be even more exhausted than you are today. We just know that's true. The solution is not more time, but it's more time on what matters most. It's not that we need more time. It's that we need to spend more time on the things that matter most. This Christmas, spend time on what's most important. Don't build a business and lose a marriage. Don't work so hard for your kids to do every single activity known in the universe and they don't even know how to follow Jesus. Don't work so hard to make more money to buy more stuff that you don't really need anyways. Don't schedule another event when your wife and kids would just rather hang out with you. Don't put something on the calendar just because you can. Just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. My wife shared a quote with me, and I've been saying this to her for years, but this quote is way better than the how I used to say it, and it says this, I'm not saying no because I'm busy. I'm saying no because I don't want to be. We have this mentality, oh, I'm not busy that day, we could do something. Well, maybe we say no so you're not busy, so you can rest, so you could walk with Jesus, so you could just listen. 
to what Jesus. I wonder if Jesus is actually speaking to you right now, but you're too busy to stop and hear what he has to say. Don't spend time doing more stuff. Spend more time on what matters most. Man, I'm so glad I finally slowed down and rested. I feel like a new person. And I think we all need to begin this practice because our spiritual enemy, the devil, is smarter than we think. If he can't get us to sin, he'll get us distracted. He'll get you weighed down. He'll fill you with burdens. He'll get you so tired. And like Vince Lombardi said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And he's going to wear you down. This Christmas, slow down and rest. You don't need more time. You just need to spend more time on the things that matter most. Because the truth is this. That busyness in our day and age, it might just be the greatest enemy to our faith. And what I just want to do for the next few moments, uh, my wife Nikki and Elena, they're going to sing a song. But I want you to stay seated. And, it, and I want them to sing this song as almost like a blessing over you. Maybe a reminder to you. And however you want to respond, you can just stay in your seat. You can close your eyes. They're actually going to put the words on the screen. Maybe you could read the words if that, whatever helps you process it. But before we move on, I just want to take a moment and just receive this blessing that they're going to sing over us. This goes out to the worried. This goes out to the strays. Sorting out a million thoughts running through your for everyone that's waiting for better days ahead. Tired and frustrated, leaving words unsaid. Please don't hold your breath. Just breathe. It's a me. I just want to read a scripture that we read last week, but I want to read it as a prayer for you. I just want you to receive the best you can. Just relax, just breathe. And I want to read this scripture. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Lord, we just ask that this Christmas we could slow down, that we could just spend time with you. Lord, help us just to breathe. It's okay. You don't have to do more. You're not going to impress Jesus anymore. You don't need more time. We just need to spend more time on what matters most. Lord, I just pray that as some of us begin to learn to slow down, and it's a process. I'm working on it. 
just to rest and listen. Some of us are going to take this position of Mary and just metaphorically speaking, sitting at the feet of Jesus in a posture of a disciple, waiting to hear what he says to us. Lord, I just pray that there would be a revolutionary change in our lives. Busy is not good. Slow is good. Patience is good. Kindness is good. Your walk with Jesus is most important. Your family is most important. Modeling what it is to walk with Jesus to your family is most important. Trust me, they won't remember the Christmas gifts. They won't remember all these little things, how the house looked or how the cookies tasted. They're going to remember how you treated them, how you lived your life, and the example we gave to people. Lord, help us this Christmas season to spend our time on what's most important. Thank you for the rest we have in you when we slow down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.